What's good, friends? List episode 63 of the Game Pass Gamecast coming at you. Ladies and gentlemen, it has finally happened. We finally know how much and when we'll get our hands on both of Microsoft's next-gen systems. And yes, I said both because the Xbox Series S is now officially a real actual, not rumored and made up thing, that will launch at $299 alongside the Xbox Series X at $499 on November 10th, 2020. So this week, we examined how the Series S's very consumer-friendly price point, given its technical specs, could really be the perfect sale in gaming for 2020, having the potential to own the holiday shopping season, and the impact this could have on Sony's pricing strategy for the PlayStation 5. Plus, EA's on-demand game subscription service, EA Play, has found its way to another platform, Xbox Game Pass, meaning for no additional costs, Game Pass subscribers will get all of the benefits to EA's premium service. Is this consumer-friendly initiative helping EA set a new trajectory heading into next-gen with gamers' faith? And can we see the publisher pivot the service to be a more supplementary add-on service to other gaming subscriptions? Also, the newest installment of Ubisoft Forward has arrived and thrown us a surprise or two as we loom closer to the launch of the next generation family of Xbox systems. We discuss what we're most excited for, and not, from their newest digital event. All of this, and much more, on the newest jam-packed episode of the Game Pass Gamecast. <laughs> now the fun begins. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of the Game Pass Gamecast, your weekly go-to podcast for all things Xbox, Xbox Game Pass, and PC gaming, including news, rumors, and conversations around them damn good video games. You can catch new episodes of the show when they drop each and every Friday morning on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and all other major podcast services. So, be sure to subscribe to us, rate us, review us, all that jazz wherever you get a podcast at, and follow us on Twitter at GP. GC podcast stay up to date with everything regarding the show, video games alike, and our dope giveaways. I'm your host as always, Travis White, aka Travis on most internet platforms. Joining me as always, my partner in crime, the dynamic duo, Mike P Pack. Mike, what's good? What's going on? And as always, what have you been playing, my man? Oh, you know, still on that uh, crack pipe that is Halo MCC. So <laughs> still playing a lot of Halo Three. That's about it. Um, you know what? I- I'm 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 challenging myself. To because you're admitting it is a crack pipe, so I totally don't, you know, envision you not playing it within the next week. So I'm challenging my own self to go out and find a better approach to that question for you next week because I know what the answer is every week, but I want to find a better approach to it, you know, for you to dig into maybe the minutia of you know what you've been doing in Halo that week since you are our you know consummate Halo pro within the show because it sure as hell ain't me and you know that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just been, I just can't put it down. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's just one of those things where like, I know there's a lot left in the tank and Mm -hmm. I'm not ready to stop or quit yet. So here Mm -hmm. I am. And I, uh, I'm getting paid Friday and I got to double check my budget, but I think I might've worked $40 in there for Tony Hawk. So I think I want to pick that game up. And, uh, you know, give Tony Hawk a try, but also need to pick up Among Us for five bucks because the uh, yes. game's getting uh, very popular right now, which is great for them, uh, indie dev. And it's only five bucks and yeah. it seems like a really cool game and a good idea. So mm-hmm. it, it seems like it's a game that's built so well for obviously, you know, private matches, you know, group matches, getting friends together, the consummate discord chat like you and your buddies jumping in a chat channel on discord and just playing and then also too it feels like it is going to be one of those perfect streaming games i mean we're already seeing it too we're seeing top streamers jump on ninja jack like all the big top streamers are already starting to play and say yeah let's let's get a group together and play mm-hmm. among us you know it, it seems like it fits itself so well for that yeah i, I mean i it's just really cool because I think it's something that we all can enjoy, like our friend group too. Like we finally just got together to play fall guys, which was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm just looking forward to digging into some more like lighthearted games because probably one of those games like tabletop, Sam, mm-hmm. like fall guys, that's like 
literally perfect for our group because there's some hardcore gamers in our group, uh -huh. there's some not so hardcore gamers in our group, and the skill gap is so wide that like it's literally like the perfect fit. Like uh -huh. it'll just be like the catch all that you don't have to be really be a hardcore gamer to have fun with it. I think it'll just be a, a good time. Yeah, oh for sure, absolutely. Um yeah, it's one of those games I need to pick it up because I like you say, I check every single box, you know, in agreement with you that it's one of those games that I can just see us getting a group of all of our friends. It, it not really, you know, in the sense of, you know, and it's not a very, phys you know, graphically demanding game by any means. It resembles that of almost a flash game. So, you know, it, it's something we could get more people into. We can get your cousin into, we can get people who are just wanting to hang out one night and feel that almost board game esque experience that you can just pop in and everyone have a good time. So, I'm we already definitely... know that Marshy will be on that crack pipe. Oh yeah, hundred percent sure. Marshy's always it. I'm I'm shocked he hasn't brought it up to play. You know, brought it up to us already to go and play it. But um, definitely something I agree that I want to get in. And same with Tony Hawk. Um, right now I'm I'm like you. I noticed that I have like exactly forty dollars in like money back on my credit card right now. Where it's like, oh, that could easily just go and pick up Tony Hawk right now. Plus I have like, I kind of. Uh, planned ahead knowing that this year well before pre-covid and the world went to shit and everything like that but knowing this year was going to be such a clusterfuck in terms of game releases and everything anytime anybody asked me what do you want for christmas what do you want for your birthday because if you don't know my birthday is literally a week after christmas so they kind of all get jumbled in there i literally just told everyone best buy gift cards that's it best buy gift cards that's the easiest thing to get me because then literally that covers all my games that i usually buy throughout the year so it's, it's, I'm, I am agreeing with you that it's like, it's right there. I could see myself spending that 40 bucks so easy because I'm like you. I have fond memories of that game, uh, you know, the original games and whatnot. I just hope this, the sales for this, and it seems likely that it will. Um, it seems like, it seems like in general that that genre of quote unquote sport game transcends that a little bit and leans more into, I think, arcade than sport. That I think there'll always be a place and a want for that not necessarily the sim-esque experience like you can get from a skate or even skater xl session whatever you you know plug in whatever sim type experience you want there but where it's much more time attack based it's much more you're worried about high scores you're worried about there's more pomp and circumstance to it and more you know hyperbole with it whenever you look at you know a lot of the presentation so i always think there'll be room for that experience compared to a lot of sports games and whatnot but um i just hope that we get a thug out of it a thug remake me personally i want i want that bitch eric sparrow brought to fucking 4k just so we can shit on him again <laughs> it's almost like i i almost like single-handedly want to purchase the uh purchase it just to show the company and tony hawk that like there is mm -hmm. a market for this like give yeah. me more because honestly you know, as much as I, like, pump the tires on Thug, and don't get me wrong, like, Tony Hawk's Underground is, like, I mean, for a skating game at its times, like, almost mm -hmm. fucking borderline, like, perfect. Like, realistically speaking, like, so arcadey and, like, you can choose yeah. the shit out of it, sure. But, like, dude, if you weren't, like, me and Adam, who were weirdos and played it, like, did a new playthrough, like, every two months, <laughs> we were just grinding insane playthroughs. Right. And, like, we would literally get to, like, the last section in, like, four hours, like, because mm -hmm. we would just cheese it but right you know if you weren't someone that did that it's still a, a really fun time and uh basically this whole spiel to go on and say like i think tony hawk 3 is the best game in the entire franchise mm -hmm. like tony oh, hawk 3 down. is like the fucking tits yeah. and i thought thug was really good but i love tony hawk 3 so i'm hoping like supporting all of this uh you know Tony Hawk's one and two, the remake, like I'm really just hoping it'll show them that there's a market for it and that they need to, you know, fill that, mar that market. No, absolutely. And shout out to Vicarious Visions, man. They fucking destroyed it with the Crash Insane Trilogy remake, you know, collection that they did. The uh, Crash uh, Nitro cart or whatever it is, the Crash, uh, the CTR remake that they did, um, you know, and obviously now with the Tony Hawk's one and two, you know, remakes, it's, they just absolutely crushed it. They're becoming almost on par i would me personally they're starting to trend to that direction of a blue point where you can just give them them give them the just straight up tear down build back up remake start from scratch you know remake of games like they could become that studio so shout out to them um on my end with what i'm playing 
kind of want to touch on two things, I guess, majority. And you could call this, I guess, my review in progress. Um, And I'm talking Marvel's Avengers. So I was very skeptical of this game jumping in. Um, Though at the same time, go back on the show. That was one of those games that we ended up praising You know, at first, you know, we were like many when it was first really shown off and we first started talking about it and really the game was first re-revealed the last year um, and was kind of started to slowly be brought out, uh, you know, after Endgame comes out and, you know, a lot of people making comparisons to that unfairly, in my opinion, and things like that. But one of the things on the show we really, you know, praised um, Crystal Dynamics for whenever, you know, presenting this game moving forward was... They kept honing in on what the vision of this game is, what this game is, what you're going to be doing in this game, how they're going to achieve this goal that they have. And, you know, I definitely believe, still, you know, single-handedly believe that is the case even heading into this game. But to preface all of this, you must know I've never been a Destiny person. I've never, like, I play quote-unquote games as a service, but it's more multiplayer games like, you know, FPSs and third-person shooters and things like that that aren't based on you know, that are looter shooters or anything like that, where it's, you know, the division or destiny or, you know, where it's grinding for gear and the game is all about the end game when you get into it, you know, and to, to those who are into that game, hats off to you by all means, um, you know, that it's just never been something that I jumped into, though I have enjoyed destiny two much more than destiny one, the, you know, 20 hours I have played of it. So it just never speaks to, those type of experiences never speak to me because it never seems like it's, I don't like playing a game just to grind for grind's sake, um, where I feel like that never is rewarding. But when we're talking Marvel's Avengers, somebody who, and this is coming from somebody who is a comic book nerd. This is coming from somebody who is in love with the source material, the comics we're talking. I love the, the zany aspect, the, the far out there approach that comics take to narrative design and, you know, a narrative story where you throw out a sense of belief in, you know, in realism and you just, you know, you're just leaning in, just saying, cool, whatever you're telling me, that's the story. That's the world that I'm built into. And that's what I love so much about comics. And when we're talking single player for this game, that is absolutely what this game does best. In my opinion, the coming from somebody who is jumping into this, playing this primarily single player, where I don't really have a lot of aspirations to jump in. Now, granted, when cross progression eventually comes in and I see a sale for this game on Steam for 15 bucks or 20 bucks or something like that, I'll probably pick it up on PC because I'm at least more more keen to want to jump into that um, on PC and, you know, commit the time to it because of a lot of the technical issues, which I'll get into in a second, but, you know, seem to be pretty much more you know, the limitations, I guess, for console or what seemed to be the big hindrance with this. So playing on my PC is obviously the much more preferred method. But from a single player perspective, this game, I'm really enjoying the story. I'm close. I wanted to try to beat it because it's not a long story. I mean, my God, it only probably, I've only been playing for probably five hours of it. Seven, maybe at the very, very most. And that's like setting my, the controller down, looking at my phone, yada, yada, you know, getting distracted or whatever. So from that aspect, the game to me is awesome because I call bullshit on the people who say, oh, this is this is the uh, dollar store equivalent Avengers. This isn't, you know, oh, the real Avengers are, you know, uh, Robert Downey Jr., Chris Evans, uh, Scarlett Johansson, yada, yada. I call bullshit on that because if you are a comic book fan, if you are somebody who's watched or paid attention to comics in any sense, in really any form, you know, that that's presented through any medium – their comics are based around multiple runs, multiple different stories, multiple different perspectives, multiple different iterations of these characters that having somebody else play these characters is like the most comic book thing in the world. Like to me, I I would rather have that than the MCU character or actors come in who I adore. Don't get me wrong, but come in and play this game or come in and reply, reprise their roles in this game, have them different character. I like that. This is, that Marvel games is leaning into the commitment that they took starting with Marvel Spider-Man, where they're saying, no, this is separate from anything else. This is separate. This is a separate universe from the MCU. This is, this is no 
you know, licensed movie game, anything like that. No, this is our story. These are our Avengers. These are the Avengers that we want. And I really appreciate that because while I fucking love um, Nolan North, if you don't know me, and granted, this is an Xbox show, but the Uncharted series is hands down one of my favorite series of all time. I have a fucking Uncharted tattoo on my arm. So I'm an Uncharted stand to a degree that I love Nolan North's, you know, I love his acting chops when it comes to voice acting and his range that he has. Granted, I think that's just me being too close to that character like Nathan Drake that I don't really buy him as Tony Stark in that role. But that's also, I think, just a me personal thing. But everyone across the board, especially, you know, when we're talking bringing in a person of color for the, um, the bringing in a character that is a person of color with Kamala Khan and making them the lead integral piece of the story who Miss Marvel has always been kind of a, I don't know, I don't want to say taboo, but like a side character in a lot of Marvel lore and whatnot, making them, making her the, you know, centerpiece of this Avenger story and making her be the glue that brings all of them together and you playing primarily as her was fucking fantastic. And I can't say enough great things about the single player story. I love it. I mean, they took, you know, Murdoch, who is a very much a taboo Marvel villain, and made him, you know, a great focal piece and wrap the story in. Like, sure, it isn't, it isn't, you know, something that's going to win, you know, I think BAFTA awards for narrative design or anything like that, but it is a great comic book story. And I really enjoy it. And that's the thing that's kept me pushing through this experience because outside of that, is a lot of negatives. Like, I, the technical limitations of this game, the technical issues that you face are absolutely abysmal that uh, there's been many a times that I've just kind of put the controller down and been like, I, I, I don't want to play right now. Just because, I mean, the first, and this is no spoilers, obviously, because she is fucking posted on the box. You know you play as her, but the first uh, mission that you play as Black Widow is pretty much the last half of it is almost unplayable on consoles. And I'm playing on, like, the mid mid gen refresh console like the Xbox One X PS4 level consoles that you would think they're you know would benefit the most out of this and I'm playing on performance mode and I'm getting like 10 frames a second and that's at like 1080p it's probably you know pushing out or rendering out that there's so many frame issues there's so many clipping issues there's so many you know I'll get T poses and things like that it's just it's 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 very immersive breaking for what they're trying to do when you're they're wanting you to invest in this world. Um, and not to mention too, me personally, like granted, like I said, full disclosure, not a destiny guy, not a big, you know, uh, looter shooter grind fest guy, like just never really uh, you know appealed to me as a gamer. But the things in there that should keep you coming back to actually want to invest your time in and grind out don't seem to be there for me. Like, there doesn't seem to be a good loop that pulls you back in saying, yes, that's what I want. Yes, this is the gear piece I want to try to grind out. Granted, like I said, may just be me, but at the same time, I'm seeing so many other people say that who are, you know, destiny heads, who are people who grind hours in division, that it's like, what's this end goal that we're grinding for? Why are we going through playing these missions over and over and over? Why are we going through and doing these strikes? Why are we doing these things that... There's no, the end game should be what you power through to get to, and that's where the fun starts, where it just doesn't seem like the fun's there. Now, granted, they have, you know, Crystal Dynamics hats off to them because they gave everyone a really great roadmap to get through of, hey, this is where we're leading to, this is the, you know, this is the content you're going to be playing in the next month, two months, six months, a year, like, we got these new characters coming, yada, yada, so, you know, it, it, it's suffering from a lot of the same things that most games as a service struggle from right out the gate, that there's a content drought. Um, but I think a lot of people were expecting a little bit more, and especially from, you know, the single player perspective, because, you know, Crystal Dynamic did say, hey, you could play the single player. You can go in, you could just do it, you know, yada, yada. To a degree, that's right. And I love, like I said, love the campaign, love everything about it, but just... What they do with that, and you're, you know, I had one of our good what do you friends. Do? Yeah, what do you do? I had one of our good friends reach out to me who loved Marvel Spider Man and said, Hey, man, is this a game that I should, is Avengers a game I should be getting? You know, me, love Marvel, loved Marvel Spider Man, loved everything about it. Like, is this an open world game? Yada. And I had to explain, like, kind of what it was. 
And the big thing was, if you have Marvel Spider-Man in your mind, you will not enjoy this game. Period. Like, because everything that game does just blows this out of the water from a hand-to-hand combat perspective. Whenever you're thinking, hey, I'm playing as Captain America, it's probably going to have at least a similar move set to Spider-Man from the basis of this is a melee-based character. It's not somebody who has guns or whatever. You know, so all the punches, everything like that doesn't... Half the time, you know, you can't interrupt enemy actions like if you if you see an enemy going to punch you and you get a punch in early they're still it doesn't break their animation or anything you still get hit there's you know the targeting system which you would think they fucking figured it out in 1998 with ocarina of time that completely struggles with for some reason that half the time you won't you won't automatically you know lock on to after you kill somebody you won't automatically lock on to the next target which then you're just throwing random punches out in the air and then you get your shit kicked in and it's you know it's just and like for the hulk for example you're playing as the hulk you should be that should be a very op character to a degree when it comes to damage and being able to take damage you know yes it's going to have some weaknesses and whatnot that balances out you know why you're playing these characters with you know it wouldn't be fun to just play as him but that, that makes you feel, this game makes you feel less like the Hulk than you would ever think because of how its moveset just, like, the character's just so weak overall that it just, like, you you still want to play as the Hulk. If I'm going in here playing as the Hulk, I'm expecting to fucking, you know, start running in there and fucking cleaning house a bit where you just don't feel like that at all. It's very, you feel very weak, underpowered, whatever, you know, throw in whatever adjective you want to, but... It's just, there's a lot to, I I personally don't recommend this game right now. If you're a huge Marvel fan and you want to get out there and play it, sure. Um, you know, but I definitely wanted to pick it up to obviously to talk about it on the show this week because it is a great talking point. And there are a lot of good things to like about this game, but it's good things that I could see evolving over time. Like I could see this game having its renaissance a year in, almost being like, you know, what we've seen a redemption story with. The Division, you know, the original Division, um, uh, Rainbow Six Siege, uh, Destiny even whenever after splitting from Activision and starting New Light, you know, it's it's stuff like that. So, you know, sorry that was a little long-winded, but that's kind of my review of Marvel's Avengers right now. I definitely say if you're a big games to service person and you want to get in, you love Destiny and you love Marvel, sure, that may check a couple more boxes than you, but even from that standpoint, there's still room for improvement, a lot of improvement. And I definitely recommend don't play this on console, play it on PC if you can. Um, But for right now, for the casual player who just wants to get in thinking they're going to have this, you know, similar experience to Spider-Man or whatnot, there's shades of it with the story and the emphasis on character development and whatnot. Outside of that, they're few and far between, though. It's the, you know, the campaign's probably only seven hours long, I would say, for, you know, eight at the most, so... I would hold off on it. But second game I wanted to talk to, I won't spend that much time on, and then we'll get into the actual show because there's a fuck ton of stuff to talk about. Um, but the uh, second chapter of Tell Me Why dropped last week. Um, my fiance and I actually finished it. We're recording on Thursday, really late in the week um, than we normally do. Uh, we finished it yesterday. Fucking stellar. Um, I don't want to obviously give too much away because we're, you know, it's kind of the penultimate episode, and uh, with episode three being the final. Uh, that just dropped today. So it really sets up the crescendo of the story. There's a lot of... It's tying some threads together while also leaving some open that lead to a bigger, I think, resolution at the end, which you want a good narrative game to do. Um, So I'm really excited about this. I have full faith in uh, Don't Nod with how they handle their narrative design and um, how they approach storytelling in games, and especially with the, you know almost point-and-click walking sim uh, old-school adventure-esque game that they have, uh, very Telltale-ish. But, um, you know, I definitely... It's a game I definitely suggest anybody who has an Xbox or, you know, Game Pass on PC, pick it up, play it. It's, you know, you're going to play it for probably six hours, seven hours, something like that, uh, now that all three episodes are out. And I can't stress enough, it's it tackles a lot of real-world subjects and in a really great way um and i definitely think it's even at the basis educational for a lot of people and it opens your eyes to a lot of the things that you know um the lgbtq community faces and you know transgender people face and 
really at the basis the brother and sister connection that both characters have um so i definitely recommend it it's a really great game um yeah don't nod just fucking kicks ass i'm a don't nod stan so um mike after that long-winded of what i've been playing and reviews and all that shit Let's get into Button Mash for the week. This is where we're going to go through over some quick hit news stories before we go and head into our big tops this week, which we do have quite a few. So, kicking it off here, Gears Tactics, the turn-based strategy game set in the Gears of War universe that launched earlier this year, will be released on Xbox Series X, Xbox Series S, and Xbox One on November 10th, 2020. Yeah, we talked about the Xbox Series S right now chakra we're going to talk about later that's a big thing so just forget i said that um <laughs> assassin's creed valhalla release date has been moved up one week to november 10th to match the launch of both the xbox series x and the xbox series s ea has announced that former nfl quarterback colin kaepernick will be returning to ea man series as a top free agent in man 21 this is Kaepernick's first appearance in an EA Madden NFL game since 2016. In a statement published on the official Madden NFL Twitter account, EA says, quote, Colin Kaepernick is one of the top free agents in football and a starting caliber quarterback. The team at EA Sports, along with millions of Madden NFL fans, want to see him back in the game. Knowing that our EA Sports experience are platforms for players to create, we want to make sure Madden NFL, is, Madden NFL is a place that reflects Colin's position and talent rates him as a starting QB and empowers our fans to express their hopes for the future of football. We've worked with Colin to make this to make this possible and we're excited to bring it to you uh, excited to bring it to all of you today. Unquote. Under the horror game with shades of PT, the playable teaser from Hideo Kojima, if you remember that, that kind of was Silent Hills and I digress. It was a fucking spooky game. So, Under the horror game with shades of PT set on a sinking ship will arrive for PC on October 25th with console releases to follow at a later date. From developer Globus Interactive, set on an abandoned sinking, sinking ocean liner in the aftermath of a torpedo strike, Under has you playing World War I veteran Alexander, Alexander Docter, Doctor and attempting to escape the flooding lower decks and hostile entities stalking the halls. The game will involve a mixture of puzzle solving action, both in terms of escaping the flood and combat, and stealth as you try to avoid the gruesome creatures around the ship, which may be a visualization of Alex Alexander's own trauma from war. Cyberpunk 2077 developer CD Projekt Red has made some clarifications about the game's multiplayer only microtransactions, noting that they won't be quote unquote aggressive. In an earnings call, CEO Adam Krishnik, Krasinski sorry, was asked about how aggressive the studio plans to be with multiplayer monetization in Cyberpunk 2077. Quote, We're never aggressive towards our fans. We treat them fairly and we're friendly. So, of course not. We won't be aggressive. But you can't expect great things to be bought. Uh, Krasinski explained. The goal is to design monetization in a way that makes people happy to spend money. I'm not trying to be cynical or hide any or hide something. It's about creating a feeling of value. Krasinski notes that Cyberpunk is, quote, a great setting for selling things, but the studio's approach won't, quote, upset gamers. The studio's Twitter account later clarified its position on Twitter in light of Krasinski's comments, making clear that the game's single-player portion will be entirely microtransaction-free. Quote, Cyberpunk 2077 is a single-player game with zero microtransactions, the tweet begins. One single purchase, no tricks. In a follow-up reply, the account noted that Cyberpunk's multiplayer component will feature some microtransactions as previously revealed. Dirt 5 has received another delay and will now launch on November 6 for PC, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One. A press release explains that, quote, the revised launch date will allow Codemasters to release a, all versions of the game in a shorter time frame with the next generation of consoles launching expect, launches expected for this holiday season. EA has responded to the fan outcry caused by intrusive ads in UFC 4 on Reddit and has confirmed that they, quote, have, have been disabled by the team and we apologize for any disruption to gameplay that the players may have experienced. The following statement is as follows, quote, I'm part of the community team here at EA and I wanted to post here and give, give you all an update on the situation. Earlier this week, the team turned on ad placements in EA Sports UFC 4. That appeared during the, quote, replay moments in gameplay. This type of advertising inventory is not new to the UFC franchise, though we have typically reserved displaying ads to specific main menu titles or Octagon logo placements. It is abundantly clear that you, from your feedback that integrating ads into the replay and overlay experience is not relevant. 
The advertisements have been disabled by the team, and we apologize for any disruption to gameplay that players may have experienced. We realize that this should be should have been communicated with players ahead of time, and that's on us. We want to make sure our players have the best possible experience playing EA Sports UFC 4, so ad integration and replay and overlay experience will not be reappearing in the future. Thank you for your continu continued feedback on EA Sports UFC 4. And finally, Foon Tuning. Thune Tourney, I'm so sorry, a California-based programmer has made 1993's Doom playable on a pregnancy test, <laughs> truly taking will it run, the Will It Run Doom challenge to a whole nother level entirely and securing virginity across the world for all gamers. That last part was an editorial because that's something probably happened. <laughs> Foon took to Twitter to share their progress in making videos playable on a pregnancy test, including Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up and The Dancing Stick Bug, but the clips of it running videos of Doom and The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim are what caught the eye of many gamers around the world. Since then, they have been sharing their journey to make Doom actually playable, and now they have officially accomplished their goal uh, of making Doom playable on said pregnancy test. Honestly, go check this out. I'll I'll actually throw that in the uh, news article link section that we usually do. I'll throw in the tweet uh, thread to that too, or the link to it. it. It's pretty crazy. It's clearly, obviously, it's a black and white pregnancy test that you're looking at. You can still tell it's Doom, which is fucking wild, and actually being able to play it on there is pretty crazy. It's just wild. so, Mike. That's it for button mash. Are there any big hit or any of these quick hit news articles you want to kind of touch on before we head into our big topics? Anything you want to flesh out? Now I really want to play Doom. I know, right? I want to play. I want to play. Actually, I haven't played OG Doom in probably. It's probably since we played at Adams last, and that was four or five years ago. So <laughs> I, I would like to play that again, actually. But by all means, go ahead. Um. Yeah. I. I just hear most of these stories, and it's it's all pretty. Um. I don't know. I, I mean, it's all pretty relevant, so it's not mm -hmm. like one or two things really stick out. Mm -hmm. I think the one that I really kind of have my eyes on here is the Shades of PT. Um, mm -hmm. That game sounds amazing. Like, I can't wait to actually purchase that oh, game under. and give that a shot. Under. What's up? Under. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. I was under, like, Shades yeah. of PT. I was like, fuck, did I mess something up? No, no. no yeah, sorry. under. Under the yeah, horror yeah. game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, you're uh, it's been a long day. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell, fuck it. I, I hear you, man. Class from 8:30, and I work till eight. It's been like a, it's been a long day. But I digress. Uh, under, great, sounds great. Can't wait to give that a play. Definitely gonna have to stream that game. Mm -hmm. And yes, I actually will follow through with the like streaming possibility <laughs> of it. Uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla getting bumped up is really cool because that means that teams are potentially, especially in Ubisoft's case, having a lot of success with program the game potentially from distance which is great mm -hmm. um i don't think that being distanced will lessen the effect of crunch i think it might actually increase the influence of crunch but it might be a lot easier than if you're just sitting in a an office surrounded by other miserable fucks because you're stuck there for eight, 80 hours a week which by the way <laughs> i'm not saying you know surrounded by miserable fucks making fun of game devs like no if i was at work if i'm at work for 40 hours in one minute I'm a miserable fuck. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't yeah. imagine being there for like triple time. You know what I mean? And not oh, getting I know paid all right about for that. <laughs> so yeah, I mean those those two stories are pro or those those are probably the ones that like stick out to me the most. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, obviously, you know, like we said, the Doom uh, thing on the pregnancy test, but also to the um, you know somebody who does work in the world of college athletics and everything and sees a lot of you know activation and marketing and promotion aspects of the whole. Um, you know, the whole thing with ads within UFC 4 and integrating yeah, them sorry. into more and more and more aspects of games. I mean, we've seen it from a lot of games in general, but it's it's nice that people are calling it out or bringing attention to it because if they wouldn't, it would just continue to keep going up and up and up and up We're and up. We're so bombarded with ads in our everyday life as it yeah. is. Like, I mean, I get it in video games, like especially sports games. There's always been advertisements, but that's because that's real. It's a simulation game, right? Yeah. But for them to just completely hijack the experience to get, flood you with advertisements, like shit, did I like get off of a video game and get on Facebook? What the fuck's going on here? Right. Exactly. So it, it it's to the point where where it gets a you know intrusive. And me as somebody who has you know a background in marketing to an extent with my you know collegiate degree, you know it's. I, I get where they're coming from and wanting to do that because I'm sure at first it probably wasn't, oh, yeah, we're inking this deal and 
we're bringing this in in what is a non-intrusive way because if it's a replay experience and it's in an overlay or whatever, that's how you know people would experience 99% of sports that they see on TV. They're going to have some kind of you know uh, overlay with everything with ads and whatnot. There's ads on everything. So it's not as intrusive, but you also have to realize, I'm sure EA needs to be more cognitive of their audience that they're reaching out to, that it's not people who necessarily watch sports all the time. You know, yeah, there is a, you know, a large overlap whenever it comes to people who game and watch sports and whatever in that 18 to 35 male demographic, you know, I get it. But at the same time, that's not always the case. And especially with gaming, something that, you know, has always been something that is looked at as nerdy or something like that, you know, which I totally call bullshit on. But point being, you know, you're talking to another demographic and sometimes you need to read the room a little bit. Um, So, but Besides that, Mike, let's get into our big topics of this week because there is a lot to fucking talk about. And we've already spent 30 minutes talking about everything else besides that. So let's get into our big topics this week. Obviously, if you've seen the thumbnail, obviously, if you've seen the title, it finally fucking happened. We got two major next-gen announcements, and we're kicking it off one with the Xbox Series X. We got a launch date and price, baby. Xbox Series X launches on November 10th for four ninety nine. This comes from Tom Warren over on The Verge, as always. Link in the description. And they, we have two, basically, brother-sister articles with this. Two different articles, both from The Verge, but you'll see whenever we get into it, since it kind of leads into one topic. So, Microsoft is launching its Xbox Series X console on November 10th for four ninety nine US dollars. Pre-orders for the new console will begin on September 22nd, with the company also offering the Xbox Series X through its Xbox All Access program. Xbox All Access is a bundle that splits the cost of an Xbox console, Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, and Xbox Live into monthly payments across 24 months. The Xbox Series X will will be available through Xbox All Access for $34.99 a month per month, yeah, sorry, including Xbox Game Pass Ultimate. Microsoft is rapidly expanding the Xbox All Access pro- program in time for the holiday season and includes Xbox Game Pass Ultimate built in. Xbox All Access will now be available in 12 countries in time for both the Xbox Series X and S launches on November 10th. Australia, Canada, Denmark, Finland, France, New Zealand, Norway, Poland, South Korea, Sweden, the UK, and the US will all have the all-access options this holiday with more than uh, more markets to follow in 2021. So, And I wanted to make sure I threw that in there because we do have quite a large demographic um, of uh, international listeners. So shout out to you guys. Make sure you jump on that. If you're trying to get into next gen, that's a fucking great deal. If you break it all down, you're actually saving money. Um, so pairing with that too, it finally fucking happened. Microsoft confirms the 299 Xbox Series S console. This comes from Sam Byford over on The Verge as always. Uh, link in the description. Hours after Microsoft's Xbox Series S console widely leaked, the company has gone on record to confirm its existence. In a tweet, Microsoft describes the Series S as offering, quote, next-gen performance in the smallest Xbox ever and lists the price as the previous leaked figure of $299. US dollars. In, the U- in the UK, it'll cost £249. It's coming November 10th, the company revealed uh, in a new trailer later that day. The company image gives a better look at the Xbox Series S than the first leaked picture, showing how thin it is and confirming the lack of a disk drive. As the wide, or as the leaked imagery, or as with the leaked imagery, the Series S is pictured standing upright, but the orientation of the Xbox logo suggests it's expected to be more commonly used in a traditional horizontal configuration. That's about all the information right now, Microsoft says, as it will show more info soon. As previously leaked, though, the Xbox Series X is an all-digital console capable capable of running games at 1440p at up to 120 frames per second. It will support direct X-ray tracing, four-scale upgrading for games, and will actually have the same, both the same CPU and GPU as the Xbox Series X. So, Mike, fucking finally. We know how the hell much we're paying for both of these, both of Microsoft's next-gen systems, and when the hell we'll actually be needing to pay for them. And I'll be honest, dude, for the Series X, it's pretty much what we expected. We kept saying the ballpark of $499, whether, you know, we're talking $50 up, $50 down, something like that for the most part. But $499 has always been something. $500 has always been what we kind of expected for this console. But, man, I'll be quite honest, that Series S price is ridiculously competitive. I mean, more so than... I think a lot of people expected, in my opinion. So I kind of want to focus on that to start with. So 
with a similar spec sheet in terms of, like I said, the G, uh, CPU, GPU, the velocity architecture is the same you're getting. You're getting a 512 gigabyte uh, M.2 SSD, the custom one that's in the Series X as well. So you're getting the same, you know, load speeds and load times like that, like you're getting with the Series X. And being able to just achieve so many of those features that is Big Brother has. Do you see, Mike, the Series S being the big winner out of the gate for many consumers? And could it even be the big seller this holiday with, you know, the greater casual consumer audience, I guess? Um, I think the Series S is the perfect way for Microsoft to undercut Sony mm-hmm. without lessening their like flagship console, if you will. Mm-hmm. I think that Series S is a huge win for consumers. Um, I just think it'll be amazing because if someone maybe has had an Xbox or even if they haven't had, didn't buy an Xbox this past generation or they didn't even have a single console mm-hmm. – and, you know, they've heard their friends talk about playing Warzone, playing this, playing that, get on and play NHL with us. Like, people who haven't had consoles in a long time are going to see a 299 price point for the latest to, like, get in the door. And I think that's just really good, uh, you know, for everybody, obviously. I, I don't think you can really, uh, you know, I don't think you can really argue against that. Um, I do think that, it could potentially push the Xbox Series X sales as a whole. But I think that this holiday season, mm-hmm. you're either going to get a PlayStation or an Xbox. I don't think you're going to get... I mean, some people might get PS5 and Xbox Series X, but um, I think the Series S, or the S, the Series S is going to be one of those things that is a way for people to kind of hop on the Xbox train maybe a little later than what they would have liked, or maybe just a little later uh, as they plan, because maybe some of their friends are going to be split. Like, I know that was one of the things when I was a little bit younger, even with the Xbox 360 and PS3, Uh I just know that some of the kids we hung out with in high school had PlayStation, and some of us had Xbox, and it was kind of frustrating. So maybe I know that still exists to this day, and even it. so it's more so like the Xbox kids are the ones that are – nor in the minority that maybe it'll allow some of the PlayStation kids to get involved. So I think that's really great. And I'm really excited to see, I'm just really excited for this holiday season. Like I know uh, with COVID and everything, it's been really shitty. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, in one of our later stories, we'll talk more about why um, I think the numbers for Xbox are going to do a lot better than maybe we were thinking or mm-hmm. anyone was thinking. Um, I, I think what they're doing is, so overtly pro consumer like there's no way anyone could ever try to say it it isn't or it wasn't you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like they are doing everything right coming into this generation which is one thing that we were kind of talking about it's like if you are going to go ahead and just surrender the console generation with this xbox one x and xbox one versus playstation 4 Mm -hmm. which is what they did like they just punted but we both kind of started talking about when we first started the show which probably is probably at this point what 64 weeks ago um something like that uh which is fucking wild (laughs) yeah the more i think about it we uh you know we talked at great length about what xbox or what microsoft needs to do to get back into the console world wars Mm -hmm. and then you know recently we've both kind of given given up the fact that maybe they're not worried about the console word are at all and Mm -hmm. uh i just don't think they really care and this is just proving to me that like they don't really give a fuck about playstation i thought for a while they were like waiting for sony to draw first but microsoft just pulled out their big money dicks and we're like fuck it we don't care what you have to say we don't care what you have to offer here's what we got bitch let's hear what you have and they Mm -hmm. just pulled the trigger first you know yeah and i you brought up a you brought up a point that i kind of want to uh, clear, or like look at whenever you're saying you know about people potentially buying both consoles or whatever and obviously the enth- you know enthusiasts you know people like us who live and breathe and play these games there's going to be a lot of us who probably do buy you know both the series x and the playstation 4 but i think the series s man i think it has the potential to kind of fall in that same gap as the nintendo switch where this is my my secondary console and I think this is that 
two ninety nine price point, which can we just fucking emphasize how fucking wild that is? Where you're getting pretty much next gen, you're getting next gen tech for the most part. Granted, you're pushing, you know, hey, you're going to be able to play at ten eighty p or you know fourteen forty p, and that's fourteen forty p up to one hundred and twenty frames. So you're getting a ridiculous value out of that that is probably pretty comparable. And it does, I was reading, it does upscale to 4K, but it probably does, I would imagine, a checkerboarding or something that is similar to, um, you know, the PlayStation 4 Pro. So you're getting that level of tech only better when it comes to the infrastructure and load times and the architecture within that system that you're getting at at a lesser price point. This screams to me, These this this is where I think we're going to see Microsoft actually get some, you know, bring in some of those outside uh, consumers, outside users, bring them into this ecosystem who are saying, yeah, I'm for sure getting a PlayStation 5. Like, I know I'm, I've been in the PlayStation ecosystem forever, blah, 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 blah. Oh, shit. Game Pass? Oh, mm-hmm. we get all of that? Oh, shit. Well, you know, I don't have an Xbox. That's dope and all. I don't have a PC either, you know. Yeah, you know, that'd be hard to get. I don't. I don't really like playing games on my phone. You know, I don't want to spend five hundred. Oh, oh, I could. I could play all that for three hundred bucks. Three hundred bucks plus, and I could do that for twenty four dollars or twenty five bucks a month. All of that for twenty five bucks. Yeah, sign me up. Sure, I'll spend an extra three hundred dollars on that. Now I have both next gen systems. To me, that's what screams. That's where this is going to thrive. To me, where mm-hmm. it fits in that you hear so many people say. Yeah, I either play on Xbox or PS4, you know, or PC or whatever, but I have a Switch too. Like, that, it's that secondary console. I don't play all my games on it, but I have it. You know, I like to play it, and I think it's going to shine in that, kind of that mold. But to me, I mean, this really signifies how, like you were saying, that Microsoft was saying, you know what, nobody's, if nobody's going first, you know, and granted, the way that this all leaked and everything in basically the middle of the night and, you know, Brad Sam's, uh, you know, I don't want to say leaking, but reporting on it, having concrete information, putting it out there on Throt, you know, and a video of it too, saying, you know, hey, here's what it is, here's what it looks like, and then Xbox, like, Microsoft having the balls to just throw up the, uh, the Peruvian monkey meme who just, like, is looking awkwardly, each Mm -hmm. way like like acknowledging it and then just saying fuck it yeah we're putting it out there you know like like the whole it's not called lockhart no it's not called lockhart which it always i think people were always like that was always the project name just like project Mm -hmm. scarlet was you know uh the xbox series x and how project scorpio was the xbox one X. X. yeah yeah yeah, you know just project names but for the most part though so many people i think expected it to be series s after so much rumor and leak quote unquote and whatnot so it but the fact that they're able to tackle both ends of the pricing platform we got your entry level model you can get in the door for 300 bucks or whatever and we're talking that's outside xbox all access but for just somebody walking into the store, you want somebody who's like, I don't game a ton, I only buy a couple games a year, but I do want to get the new console. Cool, here you go. We can get you settled for 300 bucks. But then there's also the enthusiast, who I want to have the best console. I want to have the, the best tech on the market right now. Cool, here's the Xbox Series X for you. So what does that kind of do with PlayStation? And that's kind of what I want to bring up to you, where I can see this, obviously, like I said, me personally, I could see this being a big hit this you know winter, with it being almost like the perfect, really the perfect like twenty like console for twenty twenty, given the fucking pandemic, the economic situation for many people, especially in the U.S., a three hundred dollar price point to get into next gen to me is so fucking alluring. I mean, granted, like I said, I'm probably still gonna go with the Series X eventually. Now, granted, mm-hmm. I you know if I'm buying both systems, and we've been critical of the Series X where there's Hey, what are we going to be fucking actually playing on this on this console? Like now that Halo Infinite's bumped and whatever. And we both kind of said like right now we could probably really start next gen with our PCs because we play every, like we could play everything that Xbox offers on PC to at least start out. So right. granted though now like that 299 option is alluring, but I'll probably still go with a Series X cuz I I want to cover that from the highest technical possible level for the show and you know writing and whatnot, but 
you know, I think this has a big opportunity to be a selling point, a big seller for that casual audience that comes in, especially that audience that, you know, has a limited budget now. They're they're not spending as much, you know, granted, though, we've seen how much more money has gone into gaming from a consumer standpoint during the pandemic because everyone's just sitting inside. They're not spending money at bars and whatnot, you know, so we've seen more money thrown into gaming. But when Christmas rolls around and families need to spend money and whatnot, like the, the budgets get a little bit tighter. So but what I kind of want to ask you next kind of, you know, as we kind of round out the discussion on the new consoles now that we know when the fuck we're actually paying for them and playing on them and whatnot. You know, with Microsoft now being kind of the de facto, hey, we shot first. We're we're Han slash Greedo. Who shot first? Microsoft shot first now in terms of price. Saying, hey, this is what you're paying for this. Because it'd been a, you know, who's going to blow their load first type of thing for how long. A pissing contest of who's going to hold out the longest between Sony and Microsoft on price. You know, thanks to these leaks. But, Mike, what does the four ninety nine price tag do for you when we're talking Series X now? And... Really, how do you think the general consumer will respond to that? You know, we've been guessing, like I said, 500 bucks for quite a while now. But with that being the quote-unquote next-gen barrier, you know, to entry in terms of price when we're talking actual, hey, this is pushing, this is the generational leap that we're talking about all the time. You know, or do you think that this reveal kind of puts Sony into a corner to force them to launch at a sub-$500 price point knowing how important, hey, we had the lowest price on the market was to the success of the PS4. Yeah, I I kind of am torn on this one because it definitely feels like like Microsoft's information essentially getting leaked. <laughs> um, it's uh-huh. it, it wasn't like they really this made the decision to pull the trigger because they could have, I guess they theoretically could have like denied it <laughs> and then like a month later just been like yeah that's what's happening <laughs> like i guess realistically speaking anyone could really do that it's like being caught red-handed doing something like if you catch a little kid doing something you're like hey are you peeing yourself and they're like no why would i do that and then you see it like growing on their crotch and you're like motherfucker i see you yeah. <laughs> like, and, and, i see you like, and i'll i'll give i'll give phil credit man phil uh phil spencer did come out and say like acknowledge everything and even said like we were planning on announcing this next week because i mean they clearly didn't throw their like sizzle reel like their uh cgi video that they had for the xbox mm-hmm. one s like their xbox series s i'm sorry i'm gonna fucking confuse that for the next how many months but they obviously didn't throw that together in 10 minutes or whatever like that was planned out and they probably did have that plan for next week but like you said it, it's just funny like just thinking about that like you're clearly doing that (laughs) yeah so i just i just think it's like i just thought it was kind of funny how i brought it up like they didn't really have to and then i thought to myself like yeah they'd kind of be jabronis if they were like no no that's not what's going on and then you know wind up releasing it so right it's cool that they you know just kind of owned up to it and Uh the way they took it in stride was pretty cool too uh you know like you alluded to with the with the uh, gif file and everything Mm -hmm. it's just to me it's like sony had probably already had a price point picked out i mean Mm -hmm. they had to have the fucking consoles releasing in like a month like dude everyone knows you know how much it's gonna be like now it's like was Sony just waiting to see what Microsoft released to go $50 under, mm-hmm. or are they going to be $25 under, or are they going to be the same price? Like, what are they going to do? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's definitely something that'll be interesting to watch. Um, as far as consumers reaction to it, I think, um, let me look here. I think the entire financing, uh, plan that is kind of, going to be released with the xbox Mm -hmm. uh which wasn't really i don't think we discussed it as part of the news uh because it's kind of i I think it's a bigger deal than most people might give it credit for um just because the financing agreement that you're going to sign to buy an xbox is going to come with xbox ultimate Mm -hmm. uh, game pass ultimate so i think that's really cool and i think that you know the price point coupled with the xbox ultimate uh, financing option is going to really push Xbox sales a lot higher than what I had thought. Mm-hmm. I kind of maybe was thinking that Microsoft would release a financing option because 
you know, Apple has done it with their devices and they've had great success with their Apple credit card that literally you can only use on Apple shit. Mm -hmm. Like people are using it a lot. People are eating that up. So, you know, I think it was only a matter of time before someone else did that. Uh, And I'm not surprised that it was Microsoft, but I think that it's going to be a major factor in the success of how the Xbox Series X does. Yeah. And, and, and even the Series S, but yeah. Yeah. And granted, like, they've had the all-access program going for a few years now, but it's never been as emphasized as it has been now. Obviously, leading up to a new console launch, they're going to want to throw that out there. They're going to want to say, hey, you can get into the door with, for no money down, 25 bucks, no interest at all between that time per- that time frame. Like, it, it's such a smart sale on their end, so... You know, to me, that's that's where that's going to. I could see that program really shining right now, but I don't know, man. Do you think, like, I guess to kind of put a bow on it, like, now that Sony hasn't been the first to... It, clearly, clearly, Sony is not going to launch above $500. They can't now. Like, they can't, they can't go above $500 because they'll instantly get tons and tons of shit. Now, granted... I still think it'll sell fine. I mean, like we've said before, the first wave of these systems are on all of the systems is going to instantly sell out. People are just ready to spend their money on that. And the hardcore of the hardcore are the ones who usually jump in on day one for these. So they're going to sell out because it's a limited quantity right off the bat. So that I'm not worried about, but I think the first six months could be to a year could be rough for Sony. If they're launching at a five ninety nine price point, like, I, I can't see them going over $500 now. I mean, do you think that the console goes anywhere near, you know, in between a, a 399 like for Sony? Do you think this forces their hand to say, fuck, we got to take it, a, we got to take it a big, bigger loss now because we can't go above $500? Or do you think they just stick at that 499 price point and kind of let, you know, Microsoft do its thing? I would, I would definitely think that, them undercutting Microsoft is a lot less important than just like, I just don't think them undercutting Microsoft is like their main game plan to to like continue to stay ahead of Microsoft. Mm -hmm. I think that their first party uh, studios and games are good enough that I don't think it's really like a factor. You know what I mean? I think it's just something where Sony has enough going for it that I don't know that undercutting Microsoft is going to be at the top of the list when it comes to, what their game plan is for the next generation. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't be shocked. Like if they would just take a loss on it and rely on their software, rely on their games to kind of pick up where they intentionally came up short. But Mm -hmm. I definitely think it's a situation where it's going to be more of a situation where uh, Sony just says, you know, we'll just release at the same price as Microsoft and we're still going to outsell them even at the same price. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And I, I, I truly don't think, I, I personally don't think with where Sony's at, they're worried about necessarily pushing for that three ninety nine price point again, because I think they've, they were in a much, obviously a much different position heading into this, this current generation that we were in, that they needed to almost have that, we're at three ninety nine we're still going to be the best place to play, where you're basically playing on a PC where our architecture mirrors that that you're able developers are easily able to develop on compared to the cell processor that we had on the ps3 that was a nightmare that you know hey that got people into this that ecosystem where now sony is the king of the castle right now they are the king of the hill where they don't need to worry about like people are naturally going to just jump onto their train not where xbox is fighting to gain ground again and offer so many consumer friendly options just to get people into their ecosystem so i agree with you i don't think th- i think they're going to do their own thing i still don't think it definitely doesn't go over 500 dollars. but i think i think we're going to be looking at both systems being at that 499 price point or at least in xbox's uh xbox situation their premium product that they're offering so mike let's head on to our next news story xbox game pass ultimate will now include ea play Starting this holiday, this comes from Joe Scrubbles over on IGN, as always, link in the description. Xbox has announced that Xbox Game Pass Ultimate will also include EA Play, the EA subscription service, for no additional cost starting this holiday season. The announcement of the X- on the Xbox Wire website explains that Xbox Game Pass Ultimate and PC members will get EA Play at no additional cost starting this holiday. Game Pass 
Ultimate users will be able to access EA Play games on all Xbox consoles plus Windows 10 PCs, while Game Pass PC members naturally will get just access to the PC versions. Xbox also notes that some EA Play games will also be available for uh, Game Pass Ultimate users to play on Android devices through xCloud. EA, game, EA games supported by the streaming service have not yet been announced. An EA Play membership previously, previously known as EA Access or Origin Access on PC unlocks full access to over 60 EA games, including FIFA 20, Titanfall 2, Need for Speed Heat, Battlefield 5, the Mass Effect games, and the Sim series. It also provides free trials for of up to 10 hours for brand new games not currently part of the membership, including the upcoming FIFA 21, as well as some member-only challenges and rewards. The news comes at the same time as the full reveal of the new line, Xbox line up, including prices and launches for launch dates for both the Xbox Series X and Series S. We've repeatedly called the X, called Xbox Game Pass one of the great or best deals in gaming, and the Xbox Series consoles will seemingly make it even better with all of Microsoft's. Microsoft Studios games launching on the service and Game Pass bringing or bridging console generations. This month, Game Pass Ultimate members will also get access to the xCloud game streaming service as part of their subscription. So, clearly, we may be a bit biased considering the name of our show, but really, God damn it, man. Like, Game Pass just is asinine from a, just a value standpoint anymore. Like, there's no argument on either side, like... Just looking at the amount of content you get for such a low price is just stupid. I mean, it's just absolutely stupid. So, you know, say what you will about EA and having an EA Play membership stand alone because I'd argue it is very much not worth the price considering how much you pay and what's available and whatnot. But the door this opens to me personally that I think of potentially for more AAA third-party titles to work their way into Game Pass through similar partner deals with publishers really can't be understated so you know plus this may be really the most consumer friendly initiative ea has done in a decade so credit credit is due where credit is due so with that being said mike where does ea go with this service moving forward does this deal with microsoft signify a shift towards you know the service being a more complement piece to different service platforms akin to a you know what we see with youtube tv or hulu tv being able to add stars or hbo to your account for a smaller additional fee do you see that becoming where they lean into a given you know i i gotta imagine comparative to many subscription services ea probably didn't have the highest membership count yeah i um i'm kind of guilty of at least supporting them because <laughs> It's definitely a service that I signed into just because I wanted to play a FIFA game and I didn't mm -hmm. want to spend 60 bucks on it. Mm -hmm. So $5 a month to me was like reasonable for me to oh, download absolutely. a 100%. year old generation game and play it. Yeah. Um, I'm excited to see that it's coming to Game Pass Ultimate because I can cancel my EA membership <laughs> mm -hmm. and not pay that $5 a month anymore and get it as part of my Game Pass Ultimate. And it's just pushing the boundaries of like how much value can be offered with something like this. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited. Um, as a gamer and for gamers that they're going to be able to kind of delve into EA games if they wish, um, you know, for literally probably nothing if they have uh, game pass ultimate. And the biggest part of it is the 10 hour demos of the new games, because then you get to play EA's games and see if it's a big heaping pile of shit. Like the last year's version was, mm -hmm. um, especially when it comes to like the sport games, like NHL, like, yeah. I won't have to buy NHL day one, to play it for a week and realize like it's the same piece of shit I bought last year and get mad about. <laughs> so it's like, okay. And same with the Madden games because Madden seems to get worse year over year and get worse ratings year over year because EA does absolutely nothing mm -hmm. to, for innovation. And it's not like, I think the thing that is, is the most ridiculous part of EA as a whole is the fact that they know year over year, they're coming out with these new games. Mm -hmm. Like, you fucking know it's coming out. Why aren't you trying to do something new? <laughs> yeah. Like you already know a new game's coming out. Like I know you were just probably getting ready for like NHL to go gold, like literally like now and it's going to come out in a couple of weeks like but by now with that game going gold and with the budget that EA has, like they should already be building the next game. Mm -hmm. And they should have a team that that's dedicated to making sure when NHL 21 comes out, it's not a 
heaping pile of shit. And when it is inevitably that a heaping pile of shit, they have a team to like work on it and fix it. And they have another team that's already making the new game because if your team's held up constantly making and fixing the garbage they released for months, that's why you get no innovation every year. And that's why it's the same game. Just reskinned with new uniforms and, Oh, you can have Bumblefuck the, um, <laughs> you can have, uh, Bumblefuck the mascot as your hockey team's mascot instead of Bumblecuck. Like, I don't know. Like, right. there's just no innovation with these games anymore, especially with EA. So you can play a year old game and really not miss out on much. Yeah. So that's the, that's probably the best part about it. And it's a great value for gamers, but it doesn't dispute or it doesn't change the fact that EA sucks. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Now, I'm not going to argue that. Um, no, but I mean, realistically, I think, I mean, obviously at a base level with the announcement, like, this clearly just is, this adds just, th the emphasis is on Game Pass. To me, this doesn't do a lot for EA. Um, now, granted, like I kind of proposed in the question, it's clearly their most, you know, really definitely, in my opinion, their most... Uh, consumer friendly initiative that they've done in quite a long time um you know where this is you're getting all of this already at one low you know they're offering you know a membership at a decent rate you said what ea ea play what's a membership price i think i pay five dollars a month but there is a 15 dollar a month version potentially i think i don't remember for sure though oh uh, let's see real quick because i want to make sure i get this right um Okay, so yeah, they have the regular one at five bucks a month, which gets you early access to select new releases up to ten hours of play, unlimited access to the playlist, which is their back catalog stuff, uh, and ten percent on EA digital purchase. Now they do have the pro version of that at fifteen bucks a month. That's early access to deluxe version of new games, unlimited access to the pro playlist. You get some pro level rewards and content and whatever the fuck that is, uh, and ten you save ten percent. Um, so to me. Like you're saying, there's there's good value with that. Don't get me wrong. I mean, especially when you look at their back catalog of stuff. But this is clearly a much bigger win for Game Pass and just another you know coat to hang on the rack when it, they're talking about the value with Game Pass. Like Microsoft is a clear winner in this, and you know EA gets a little bump with it. But now we're looking at okay, I have a Game Pass subscription, especially when it comes to if I want to play Mass Effect. For the longest time, the only Mass Effect game that was available on Game Pass is the first one, which is a fucking stellar game. Go back and watch our, you know, uh, Mass Effect episode that we talked about last year, basically now, which is fucking crazy. It's been that long, um, but I digress. The, um, But now you're going to have access to Mass Effect 1, Mass Effect 2, Mass Effect 3, Andromeda, which I say Andromeda, I've heard it's gotten incredibly better since launch. Um, but you're getting, was much... there anywhere else to go? True. Very true. <laughs> um, but you're getting much more access to that back catalog, I think is what speaks to a lot of people. So that to me expands game pass tenfold now where you're like, okay, now we're getting a lot of shit here. And two, like you're saying, you're still getting access to, Hey, when, you know, Madden drops for the first 10 hours, or if you're into Madden or NHL or whatever, you know, if you're, you're a sports game guy looking to do sports stuff, you know, you can jump in and do that if you have a Game Pass subscription for at least the first couple nights. And then, cool, that weekend, if you don't get paid till that weekend, you can go and then pick it up after. You know, so there's a this is much more of a bigger thing than that, but I could definitely see me personally, EA shifting more towards, I think we see this, like, if Sony comes with a, you know, they revamp PlayStation Now and their subscription service or whatever, and they change it more to a Game Pass model where we're seeing, you know, more Sony games coming day and date, and, you know, maybe not their big tentpole hitters, but more, you know, exclusive indies and things like that coming day and date to the uh, to the service when they launch on PlayStation. I can see EA kind of attaching themselves to that, or even, you know, now we're seeing with EA, you can do an EA Play subscription through Steam, I believe. You can set it up through there. So, like... I can see more of that kind of happening where you see with HBO, like we have YouTube TV right now. I can add now, grant I already have an HBO. We already have HBO max or whatever it is. And we were able to bundle that in where it's only like, you know, we had it before, but we were able to change it now. And it's only like five extra bucks or something like that. Like I see it kind of being a more complimentary piece. Cause now I may be wrong by all means, correct me in the comments, whatever. But for as long as EA, play access origin access whatever you want to call it 
has been going, I can't see it being it being this gangbuster, you know, deep membership, you know, it has millions of members, you know, where you're comparing it to Game Pass or PlayStation Now or something. It's it stands toe to toe with its competition in terms of subscription numbers. I can't see that being the case with how you know, those subscription services are, you know, first and foremost are t- for enthusiasts to lean into. Like, they lean into their hardcore audience to first get in the door with those. And that hardcore audience is wise to what's going on with how EA has been received the past decade for the most part. So, it, I see it more becoming that way because I can't see Access being, or Play Now, being this big gangbuster subscription service. So, but... We'll see where it goes from here. I'm 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 very much excited because that means that I now no, don't have to worry about if I ever want to go back through and play the Mass Effect series. It's right there. It's going to be on PC too, I would imagine. Um, you know, if I ever want to go back and play through Dead Space, if I because we're never fucking getting another Dead Space game, even though we should be. If I ever want to go back and you know for the new Dragon uh, Dragon Age coming out eventually. If I want to go back and play those games, I can easily jump in through my Game Pass subscription. So there's a lot of good with this. It's just clearly all in Microsoft's favor. It's not, <laughs> you know, if it was just for EA, like, nobody would really care, I don't think, still. At least the hardcore audience would. But, Mike, let's head on to our final news story here. Silent on Controversies, Ubisoft event highlights Prince of Persia remake, Scott Pilgrim's return, and more. This comes from Elise Favis over at the Washington Post, as always, link in the description. Ubisoft, the studio behind mega hits like Assassin's Creed and Far Cry, held its first Ubisoft Forward live stream back in July in lieu of an E3 presentation after the convention was canceled due to the pandemic. Thursday, September 10th, marked the second Ubisoft event, that's today when we're recording, shedding light on upcoming games like The Prince of Persia, Sands of Time remake, and another look at Immortals Phoenix Rising, previously known as Gods and Monsters. The company has had a tumultuous year. Several Ubisoft executives have stepped down amid sexual misconduct allegations. More recently, the mobile game Tom Clancy's Elite Squad faced backlash for using the Black Power Fist, a prominent symbol from the Black Lives Matter movement, to portray a villainous organization. Charlie Gilmont, the director of uh, Elite Squad, is the son of Ubisoft CEO Yves Gilmont. Hours before Ubisoft 4 kicked off, Yves Gamont released a statement through a pre-recorded video post on Twitter saying that the company failed to protect the victims. However, the com- uh, with the company citing, quote, timing constraints, the recorded statement was not included during the live stream, nor was the situation addressed during the stream. Quote, I'm truly sorry for everyone that who was hurt, uh, Gamont said in the clip. We've taken significant steps to remove all sanctions to those who violated our values and code of conduct, and we are working now to improve our systems and process. The show began with a look at Immortals uh, Immortals Phoenix Rising, previously known as Gods and Monsters, which is an open-world game where you battle Greek gods and explore a wide ripe with Greek mythology. It also is very Breath of the Wild inspired, as the article goes on to read. The lengthy teaser showed off a gorgeous world, reminiscent of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, as well as its character creation features. You play as a young woman named Phoenix who gets shipwrecked on the Golden Isle, uh, which is overrun by beasts from the underworld. Uh, Immortals Phoenix Immortals Phoenix Rising arrives December 3rd for current and next gen consoles. Just a little editorial. Mike, when you're when you're choosing a game name, what do you think would be more what do you think would get, you know, fit the bill a little bit better? Gods and Monsters or Immortals Phoenix Rising for a Greek mythology game? Ghosts and Goblins? No, that was a game from the original NES. I no. don't know if you would ever remember Yes, oh that yeah, game. I remember Ghosts and Goblins. Fuck yeah, dude. But <laughs> it's, it, like, it's like the same shit. Like how but why wouldn't, can you get? Well, no, like, to me, they came out with Gods and Monsters right off the bat. To me, that's easy to remember. Boom, boom, Gods and Monsters. Now it's Immortals, Immortals, Phoenix Rising. Like, to me... I think I think you just gotta pick... I think you just gotta go, like phoenix rising or the original name right right 100 like, i think mixing the, immortals in there is like a mouth it's like you have your mouth filled with peanut butter when you're trying to say what game you're playing right uh, clearly is i've been trying to stumble through it each time but i digress it's just been a meme on twitter for the most part of the past like week or so since they announced that they changed the name of it and because people were pretty set on gods and monsters they were like oh okay that fits the bill and it's easy to remember it's it's catchy it's right on there where now to me, Immortals Phoenix Rising is a much more marketing puff piece as like approach to the game name, but I digress. Anyways, 
Action adventure title Prince of Persia Sands of Time is returning with completely redone visuals, camera work, combat, and an all new targeting system. It now features motion capture too, alongside the recorded, uh, re recorded voice, voice lines. But uh, another editorial this game looks rough for being, it looks like a PS3 game, Xbox 360 early gen version for a game that is being redone and brought to the end of a 4K esque console generation so just to keep that in mind um for you to play battle royale hyperscape is already incredibly fast paced and ubisoft announced that it's going to be sped up even more with a limited time mode health regenerates quicker loot is limited to only max level equipment and zones close in around you much faster the mode comes as a free update on september 15th for the last six years, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, the game, a beat em up action based on off of the 2010 movie, has been delisted from digital storefronts. Now, however, fans will be able to play it once again, and this time on modern consoles. It arrives for Google Stadia, Nintendo Switch, PS4, Xbox One, and PC this holiday season. No word has been given about a physical release, and limited run games actually even... Uh, responded in a tweet to this or put out a statement in a tweet to the saying they haven't been approached by it but if they would they would absolutely love to do it so nothing concrete to that aiden pierce the diver or the divisive character from the original watchdogs is making a return to the upcoming watchdog legion legion primed as a unique playable hero with his own story arc it's a surprising move many fans felt that uh, pierce's character lacked substance in the first game that wasn't the only announcement for watchdogs legion ubisoft teamed up with british rapper stormzy whose music and likeness will be featured within the game watchdog legion arrives this october for pc and curtain gen consoles with releases on xbox series x and ps5 at a later date Riders Republic, which was this was their big and one more thing moment from you know that has been coined by Nintendo with their directs. This was their one more thing type of thing, the reveal of this new IP. Riders Republic is a multiplayer extreme sports game that lets users face off in challenges involving mountain biking, skiing, snowboarding, wingsuit flying, and more. You can ride through rocky canyons or down the slopes of snowy mountains as you try to pull off the most tricks and reach the finish line first. In Mass, Start, in Mass Starts, a racing mode, you can go against more than 50 players. Riders Republic is coming to next-gen consoles. So, Mike, while there were some decent, albeit spoiled via leaks, as always, with when it's a Ubisoft, if it's Ubisoft and they got announcements, it's getting leaked ahead of time. I think one of the biggest stories coming out of this installment of Ubisoft Forward wasn't any of those announcements, but it was the decision to release Eve's Come On statement on the shitty things, the horrible things that have taken place within Ubisoft that have recently been brought to life over, you know, being brought out before an actual stream, you know, the actual live stream, you know, obviously... Full, you know, full transparency. We completely are against the horrible things that have taken place between, you know, Ubisoft and all the decisions and, you know, the wrongful use of propaganda and things like that. Like, you know, just be good fucking people. Let's be real. You know, don't be pieces of shit and don't sexually assault women and don't try to, you know, twist things and whatnot. You get what I'm saying. But, Mike, you know, peeling all that back. Do you think this was the right decision to have this message, you know, before the show, leaving the show to focus on, you know, all the hardworking, you know, hardworking people, both on the dev side and publishing teams within Ubisoft, you know, to see their hard work be put off, you know, put to show in um, with their titles that were shown today? Or still, should they have made this video, you know, front and center right to start the show, get that message out there? Because um, one of the things they said was due to time constraints, things like that. Well, it's your own fucking show. You, you're the one, it's a digital show you're running. You're not on a time can, like, you can. Like, what? Yeah, like, ah. yeah, so. But, and then also, too, obviously, we did have some actual game announcements and things like that. So anything really stick out to you, you know, from the show today in terms of the actual games and the content we got to see? Um. Yeah, we, <laughs> I don't think we have to elaborate anymore on the, the bullshit. I think we'll just dive right into the the serious stuff here Mm -hmm. um not that the other stuff isn't serious but uh i just think we could make um entire podcasts episodes on how to not run a company 101 and showcase some of these boneheaded decisions yeah i i think it's easily you know we can and you know we can definitely i i would like to actually have a conversation one day one i say one day but in the near future where you know when we have time when maybe, you know, there isn't 50 billion fucking news stories breaking in, you know, where we can do a bonus episode or something like that, where, because I think it would be really interesting to 
sit down and bring, you know, people with different perspectives in and stuff like that. Have, you know, maybe a four person table set up, me, you and two other people or one other person or whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. Whether that's a person of color, whether that's somebody who is, you know, part of the LGBT community, things like that, that provide a different, you know, have a discussion on how you should approach it. I think it'd be really unique is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But I think at the basis, we all agree to just don't be a fucking asshole. Don't be a fucking idiot. Don't be a fucking like, don't sexually assault people. Don't, don't just go to work and do your work. Like, don't be a fucking weirdo. Don't be a piece of shit. Like, I think that kind of wraps it all up. Don't, don't, you know, try to like take movements that are trying to improve people's lives and things like that and use it as propaganda within your game and things like that. Like, just fucking, just don't be a piece of shit. You yeah, know, I think that I think that and the basis sums it that all. Entire, <laughs> that entire game, like I literally just saw an ad for Elite Squad, and yeah. you're getting your wish, buddy. Sam Fisher's coming back. Oh, I know, man. <laughs> He's in everything, you're, man. He's in everything. It. He's in everything. He's in everything, man. Except his own fucking game. <laughs> just give us his own fucking game. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like I don't really, I don't really think anything of this from this dev studio at this point in time is really that like noteworthy. Um, mm-hmm. Hyperscape has seemed to have been doing really well. Mm-hmm. Um, and it seems like it's giving the BR community a different flavor. Um, it, again, it really like, and not to cut you off, but the one thing I've noticed with Hyperscape, man, and it, maybe that's because like, you know, it's not, it's not a staple in our circle or anything. It's not within our bubble. It doesn't seem to be really latching on to, you know, uh, you know, our community with the show or, you know, even our friends who, you know, game and play a lot of BR games. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to really be latching on to, you know, anybody, but it seems to really be flying under the radar in a good way because I see a lot of streamers still playing it. Like a lot mm-hmm. of people are still like, it's getting traction. Yeah, I actually just got messaged by Jason, um, you know, how we, uh, you know, my boy Jason, mm-hmm. he was a guy that I used to kind of play BRs with, like I would play uh, PUBG with him, um, you know, I played some Blackout with him, I, he's like one of the people that like, I played a ton of PUBG with, like basically, like, because I do probably have like 150 hours in that game, which is not a ton for some people, but if if there's people that know me, um, like you, like, you know, I either have like 600 hours in a game or I have like eight, (laughs) like there's really no, I'm not like in the middle. It's just like, I have a ton of hours played in that game or I don't. So that game's like one of the ones that is actually in the triple digits. That isn't a ton, but, um, he actually hit me up and asked me to play it. So I'm kind of thinking about giving that game a, a little whirl and seeing what's going on with that. So I'm pumped for that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to um, kind of just touch on is um, the Scott Pilgrim game, uh, mm-hmm. getting to play that on a new console. I know there are a ton of people out there that are huge Scott Pilgrim versus the world fans. Mm-hmm. So it getting a fair update so you could at least play it on new consoles is, is or pretty Or you can play it because, at all. I mean, it being mm-hmm. delisted, nobody has been able to actually play that game. Right. And I know, like, I was super stoked whenever Ninja Guide and Black first a was became backwards compatible for the xbox one because it wasn't mm-hmm. b um you know whenever it was on xbox game pass because it was for like a month and yeah. like that's just awesome when some of those old obscure games like kind of come back into the fold because ninja gaiden while it has its popularity i feel like for the for the most part like there might be a lot of listeners to the show or a lot of people in general that don't even know that game exists Mm-hmm. And it's a game I feel like everyone should really know it exists because I love it. And I think that, you know, even though it's a very difficult game, I just think it's it's a special game. It was, um, you know, the storyline and everything is just really good. So mm-hmm. I- I'm excited that, you know, Scott Pilgrim fans are going to get to play the game again. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, from games like that we did see announced and whatnot, um, I mean, the Writer's Republic stuff does look kind of cool i mean i always was a big fan of and granted very obscure game but the sean white snowboarding game i always thought was really (laughs) cool where it provided you had it i did and i always got trolled from people on or like flame from people on uh 
in my like messages and shit like that while I'm playing it, like being like, "Why the fuck are you playing that? Come play like COD or whatever." And I'm like, "I don't know," because I like it. I like snowboarding, and but it was like I like that free mountain approach to being able to go and snowboard. You know, where it's much more not open world but expansive. Like you have, yeah, it, it I, gives that actual like resort feel. But granted, did you ever right, play Amp Three? Yes, yes. See, you know. I feel like Amp Three was like way too focused on like the free. Mm-hmm realm like i feel like if you kind of went in the middle like almost like a thug where it's like kind of open world not really yeah. but like but it's still kind of streamlined like i felt like that would be like a really good way to go about it yeah and and actually i was going to make a thug comparison it feels like this riders republic is very much almost combining the sean white snowboarding game and a thug approach to it where it has that almost not like it has that slapsticky uh, narrative approach that's found in the thug one and two games but mm-hmm. um it still has like it almost seems like an evolution really now thinking of it it seems more like an evolution of steep in a way only now it's going much more hey we're throwing everything when it comes to mountain sports because you got the you got the uh the mountain biking, the uh, quote unquote extreme version of that, wherever you're doing more jumps and doing more like horse riding and trail riding, but it's going down, you know, like these crazy courses and things like that. You're having those amped moments almost with this game. Um, and like you have the wingsuit, obviously snowboarding, like there's a ton that you seem like you're going to be able to do in there. There was somebody with a fucking jetpack too. Like, <laughs> like what the fuck? So like, it, it seems cool. I don't know how much I would get into it. Cause it's this mold, like, it seems like it's almost an MMO from what I'm mm-hmm. understanding. So like, I don't know how much I'll get into it, but if it's one of those that I, you know, see on a Ubisoft, like a Uplay sale or even on steam or something like that, like, yeah, I'll pick it up. I'll try it. Like, I still think like, like I was kind of saying about the Tony Hawk games at the top of the show, where it's like, to me, those games transcend the sports genre where it's more like, they'll always be a home for those types of experiences for people because it's not you're not worried about they have such a much more arcadey feel to it than simulation so like to me that holds up so much longer than you know you know Madden 2002 or whatever like you know what i mean like it's going to have it's going to have that replayability it's going to have that experience that transcends generations and that genre that kind of holds on that you can kind of really it 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 just it phases out of and it grows out of the sports genre in my opinion so like Experiences like that, I think, are always going to sell pretty well and fi- have a actual market. Um, but yeah, that who do pretty... you think? Who, who do you think was on the cover of Madden two thousand two? Marshall Falk. No. Um. No. Wrong okay. year. That's two thousand one, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, two thousand two. Give me. A... No, actually, that might have been. Uh, wasn't he on it multiple was, it years? was 03 Marshall Falk was on 03 oh three because I know oh four was Vic oh five was uh fucking what's his name from the baltimore ravens uh ray lewis killed a man um yeah eddie george was on 01 eddie fucking george i had an eddie george jersey with the titans <laughs> also is it bananas that in the year 2001 because that's when madden 2002 would have been released uh-huh. they released it on n64 yeah how crazy is that madden o- or no o2 was ray lewis no he was it wasn't on, yeah it was he was on no. toys no he wasn't i'm i'm no, it was it was fucking um. Your fucking boy. Fucking Donovan McNabb. No, it was no, Dante Culpepper. Dante Culpepper. That's right. Not Donovan McNabb. We were just talking about Donovan McNabb at our draft. Uh, you drafted him eight years post mortem. Yeah. Wasn't dead, but his career was. Yeah, I I was thinking purple. That's probably what threw me off. But yeah, Dante fucking Culpepper, man. God damn it. Jesus Christ. All right, Mike, let's head into fucking party chat for the week before it's we get derailed. It, we're getting derailed now. I mean, it's it's always fucking derailed. Let's be quite honest. <laughs> and uh, if you're new to the show, party chat is where we're going to propose one question each week at the end of the show that we want to discuss. Could be as simple as what's your favorite story beat in the game, what you've been playing during quarantine, or could be more in depth as to why the negative stigma around gaming even still fucking exists, which is still bullshit. And after answering ourselves, we'll kick it over to you to tweet your responses or email them over 
on our Twitter at GPGC Podcast, and we'll read some of them the following week. Last week's question, will we ever see the return of Splinter Cell in its proper form, let's say within the next 10 years? And this comes from Derek via our email. I think Sam Fisher will be known for his guest appearances in games more than his solo games, which I feel you on that recently. Uh, Similar to Little Wayne being known so well for his features than his more recent work. So no, I don't think so. I, I tend to agree. <laughs> Damn, did he just, like, destroy all Sam Fisher fans and Lil Wayne fans in I, I one think. fucking answer? <laughs> Two birds, <laughs> one stone, like, man. Feels like he's just throating people, dude. That's he, he, insane. He's literally fucking pocket sand. Pocket <laughs> sand. Like, he's taking them all out, man. God damn. I mean, he's not wrong. I mean, I to be quite honest, Lil Wayne, recent Lil Wayne, I mean, obviously, a couple of the original Carter albums were fucking bangers, but, like... When you think of modern Little Wayne, it is features. I mean, granted, he's cashing in on all that now. He knows that he doesn't necessarily have to, like... He can just do all the features now and get paid fucking asinine amounts of money. But I digress. So, this week's question. If you could pick one game from the original Xbox or PC... The original Xbox era or on PC, say, during 2001 to 2005 or something like that. When the original Xbox was in, you know, its heyday. To receive a complete remake akin to the likes of Shadow of the Colossus, Final Fantasy VII Remake, and now, obviously, Prince of Persia of the Saints of Time. What game would it be and why? Mike, what do you think, man? What's a game from the original Xbox? You are Mr. Original Xbox. What do you think, what's a game from the original Xbox library or PC from that time frame that you would like to see get a complete remake that maybe hasn't been done yet? And it has to be in 2001? No, it doesn't have, I'm saying, like, from the time frame that the original Xbox was released. So either during the original Xbox's release or if it's on PC around that time, like I use 2001 to 2005 because that's like the height of the original Xbox. Well, Rogue Sphere Blackthorn was released in 2001, so that's again, okay. I'll let it go. Ubisoft <laughs> isn't ever going to make another Rogue Sphere uh, Rainbow Six game. I'll give it up. It would be amazing. I would love They'll nothing more. Give up more. the sword. <laughs> <laughs> I would love nothing more in my life. But a an original Xbox game that should be get a full remake treatment. Mm-hmm. This one, let me think here. I'm just I'm thinking original Xbox exclusive. All right. I already talked about it earlier this show. I didn't even realize this is where we were going with it, but here I am, Ninja Gaiden, Ninja Gaiden Black. He's going either back. one. I did going hear back to the crack pipe. I did hear a rumor that potentially don't even don't. we're gonna we're gonna get a collection, but it sounds like it doesn't include black. So what? Yeah, and, and I knew you'd be jammed up me saying that's that. better than the first. Oh, what? I, 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 I is, shouldn't have said if, anything. If I get an entire collection, I don't care because. If they're releasing a collection like that, does that does does that mean I should really expect a new release? I mean, am I just getting my hopes up to be destroyed? I I, I won't say that. I won't say that. But yes, Ninja Gaiden, uh, Ninja Gaiden Black would be better because it had more cool things in it. But even I would settle just for the first Ninja Gaiden. I don't care. Uh, one of those two games needs remade with updated graphics i don't even really care if they were to redo the engine because Mm -hmm. i thought the gameplay was really yeah it might be a little dated and controlling the camera might be tough for some people but i just would love a new uh like graphical overhaul with uh updated um cutscenes and such Mm -hmm. i I mean my gut just says on my end i'd love to see more when get a full-fledged remake i think i think now granted if we're talking any game any Elder Scroll game besides Skyrim, obviously getting remade, which it's going to get remade again, right? Well, it's going to get remastered or whatever. You get what I'm saying. But from a full on remake, I think the one between Oblivion and Morrowind that actually would see more traction of getting a remake would be Morrowind because I think more people have nostalgia for that game. Now me personally, I think Oblivion is the best Elder Scrolls game, but at the same time, Though, I think, I think that Morwen would benefit more from that because mm. of no real, like, true voice acting. I mean, there was some in it, don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. but, like, fully voiced dialogue, everything like that, whenever we're talking dialogue from 
you know, any kind of conversation you have, it's all text-based for the most part. It's very akin to traditional CRPGs. Um, you know, so it's really, I think, would benefit more because the story within that game is great. The actual, you know, province of Morrowind is fucking fantastic to explore. And, you know, I'm glad at least some people are getting to experience that in, you know, a version of that, you know, quote unquote, in the Elder Scrolls Online, which is great. Mm-hmm. But I really think that game, having that story, the characters that you interact with in that game, the world that you have, that provenance of Morrowind would benefit so much from being brought to, I, I would just love to see what that would look like in 2020 and, you know, obviously beyond with that. So, Yeah, Morrowind, like, definitely aged worse than Oblivion, obviously, yeah. because it's much older. Mm-hmm. And I think, like, Oblivion, like, there are a lot of people that still won't give Oblivion a chance because of how dated it looks. Mm-hmm. But, like, if if people won't even let like try Oblivion, like they're not definitely not going to try Morrowind, right? No, yeah, a hundred percent, completely agree. So, Mike, I think that's going to do it for this week's episode. Where can people find you on the interwebs to talk about all the things we talked about? Whether it's the brand new, finally fucking figuring out the brand new price points and release dates for both of Microsoft's next gen systems. Whether we're talking about Ubisoft stuff and not being a shitty person and whatnot. Um, anything that we talked about today, where can people find you on the interwebs to talk about it? You can find me on Twitter at T-O-I-S-X-L-D-I-E-R. That's Toy Soldier with an X for the second O. And you can find me on Twitch at MP underscore Toy Soldier. Nice, nice. And as always, I'm your host, Travis White, a.k.a. Travis on most internet platforms, including twitter at travelis underscore that's t-r-a-v-l-e-s-s underscore you can also find me streaming time to time on twitch.tv slash travelis underscore mostly monday wednesdays for right now have worked best i'm going to try to throw in a stream this weekend so if you listen tomorrow on the show when we're recording this when it goes live on friday might be doing one friday night or some or friday saturday night something like that i don't know pay attention we'll you may see me on the interwebs. Come out and ch- hang out with me over on twitch.tv slash Travis underscore, same as Twitter. And if you want to just play some video games with me in general, you can do so over on Xbox Live at regular Travelis. That's T-R-A-V-L-E-S-S, no underscore. And that, ladies and gentlemen, has been your newest episode of the Game Pass Gamecast, your weekly go-to podcast for all things Xbox, Xbox Game Pass, and PC gaming, including news, rumors, and conversations around them damn good video games. You can catch new episodes of the show when they drop each and every Friday morning on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and all other major podcast services. So be sure to subscribe to us, rate us, review us, all that jazz wherever you get a podcast at, and follow us on Twitter at GPGC Podcast. Stay up to date with everything regarding the show, video games like and our dope giveaways. Mike, that being said, that's going to be it for the episode this week. Thank you, everyone, for listening, sharing, and being a part of our growing community. Game on, wash your fucking hands, listen to the doctors, Black Lives Matter, and we will see you next week. <laughs>